here. What is striking, though, about the people of Israel is that according to the Bible, they assume their identity prior to the occupation of any particular piece of land, and their identity endures after the land is taken from them in 587. Though the people were to return a couple of generations later, their occupation of the land of Israel would again be interrupted by the Roman invasion of 70 AD. Uh, when the temple was once again reduced to rubble and the peoples dispersed to the various corners of the empire. It was not until the late 19th century under the inspiration of the budding Zionist movement that Jews in great numbers began to return uh, to this piece of land. The relationship of the Jews to their land is by all accounts a remarkable matter in the annals of world history. This was already noticed in the book of Esther when Haman tells King uh, Ahasuerus uh, there is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. The assimilation of the Jews was obviously distinctive enough uh, to not only attract interest, but to be the subject of uh, the very first pogrom against the Jews. Uh, other ex exiled peoples, Haman applies, were easily assimilated into the culture of the Persian Empire. The Jews, however, due to their tenacious obedience to their native laws, stand apart from all others, and as a result, Haman argues, constitute a, a threat to the king's dominion. St. Augustine, several centuries later, also noticed this peculiar feature of the Jewish people. But he, being a Christian, did not count this feature as an odd ethnographic detail, but a sign of divine providence that the Jews still survive in spite of their role in having uh, God's Messiah crucified, Augustine argued, is proof that God acts in accordance with the teaching of the Gospels, that is, to love one's enemies. Though this position is considerably better than that of Haman, one still winces at the description of the Jews as, quote, God's enemies, end of quote. Yet what is important for our purposes is Augustine's historical observation that Jewish identity has survived in spite of the diaspora and in contrast to conventional historical patterns. This fact, Augustine argued, demanded a theological explanation. <coughs> the Catholic novelist and occasional philosopher Walker Percy provides a theological explanation for the perseverance of the Jews that is likely to find a more positive resonance among Christians informed by texts such as Nostra, Nostra Aetate from Vatican II. He argues that the Jewish people, as a people, point toward the reality of the God who has tied his identity to them. <clears throat> Here I'm quoting from Percy. Where are the Hittites? Why does no one find it remarkable that in most world cities today there are Jews, but not one single Hittite, even though the Hittites had a great flourishing civilization while the Jews nearby were a weak and obscure people? When one meets a Jew in New York or New Orleans or Paris or Melbourne, it is remarkable that no one considers the event remarkable. What are they doing here? But it is even more remarkable to wonder if there are Jews here, why are there not Hittites here? Where are the Hittites? Show me one Hittite in New York City. End of quote. The Hittites, of course, had a connection to their land uh, that they and their neighbors would have understood as enduring. Yet history has defied these expectations. Enter rapacious invaders and whatever was left of a venerable Indo-European culture went into rapid decline. The Jews, on the other hand, have been without land longer than they possessed it, yet the miraculous preservation of their identity is difficult to explain, save for the gracious protection of God. So what are we to make of the perseverance of Jewish identity and its peculiar relationship to the promised land? No understanding of the conquest story can avoid the larger question of the unique way in which Israel's relationship to the land is laid out in the Bible and subsequent biblical history. The person who I believe has done the best job on this problem is the Israeli biblical scholar Uriel Simon. In an important book on the relationship between biblical thought and contemporary Israeli politics, he takes up the question of Israel's claim to its land. He begins by making a distinction between a natural and a providential tie to a land. A natural tie, he writes, quote, means that a people dwells on its land and the very fact of its dwelling there gives it a right of ownership over it. And so the nations of the world see their claims to their land. Their attachment to the land is thought to be their, quote, natural right. 
that is, the fruit of significant historical events such as the place of one's birth, site of lawful immigration, conquest, lengthy period of ownership, development of a unique culture, and so forth. The natural tie is held by the consciousness of the nation as a foundational fact. The people are expected to defend their land uh, and independence, but they do not, for the most part, fear being uprooted from it. In contrast to this, Simon argues, a providential tie to the land is guaranteed by, quote, a divine promise that precedes, both temporally and logically, the actual possession of the land and is not conditioned by it. For Simon, uh, there are both, to both types of ownership, there are advantages and disadvantages. Those who possess a natural tie to their land enjoy a continuous link to their land. When uprooted for them, from their land, as the Hittites eventually were, their identity as a people comes to the unabrupt end. Think of the Visigoths, for example, peoples I always wondered about when I looked at uh, my historical atlas as a young boy. Where did all these peoples disappear to, go to? Israel, however, never enjoyed a sense of a continuous link to its land. Built into the very fabric of her covenant was the threat that if she disobeyed God's law in the way in which the Canaanites did, she too would lose her land. In Moses' last address to the Israelites prior to their entry into the land, he writes, when you have had children and children's children and become complacent in the land, if you act corruptly, I call heaven and earth to witness against you that you will soon utterly perish from the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. Most nations of the world do not feel themselves standing on, under any such threat. Israel stands under the very same danger that was once visited upon the Canaanites. Yet for Israel, all will not be lost. Should Israel repent of her sins, there is always the possibility that God will restore her to the land. And so the text continues, quote, from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and soul. Because the Lord your God is a merciful God, he will neither abandon you nor destroy you. He will not forget the covenant with your ancestors that he swore to them. Though Israel occupies a land that carries with it a threat to whomever would deign to settle there, her entitlement to that land is based on a divine covenant and no human power can stand in the way of its promises. Now, let me be certain to stress one point here. I have learned after several attempts at laying out Simone's perspective that many readers are not sufficiently patient uh, in their attention to detail. When Simone says that Israel's tie to the land is supernatural, some understand this to mean that Israel's right to the land trumps all moral responsibility. The worries of Edward Said return with a vengeance. Yet for Simone, these worries are ill-founded. It is a people who feel a natural tie to their land who believe that their right to ownership endures in spite of any moral obligation. Do Swedes, Poles, or the British believe that their right to their land is grounded in keep keeping specific commandments? Not even the atrocities of the Nazis in the Second World War led to the deportation of the German people. Will Germany remain a land for German-speaking peoples 100, 500, or even 1,000 years from now? Maybe, or maybe not. Where are the Hittites? Where are the Germans? There's no way of knowing. But it is highly unlikely that should the German uh, nation disappear, that the consciousness of the German people will endure. They would go the way of other extinct peoples before them, such as the Hittites. Israel, on the other hand, remains unique, as Haman and Augustine saw it, and Walker Percy. Even without a land, their identity is rock solid and eternal. Her link to her land is supernatural, that is, it's guaranteed by God, but that does not mean that at any given period of time she will be in possession of it. Very different than any other nation's relationship to its land. The word supernatural is used here in its etymological sense. Israel's relationship to her land does not conform to normal historical patterns. In that sense, it exceeds the natural. According to the Bible, Israel's possession of that land is conditioned on the grace of God and the moral stature of the people. To enjoy a supernatural link to the land is paradoxically to stand under a conditional promise. Unlike the Swedes, the Poles, or the Germans, there's no sense that the land of Israel is Israel's permanent possession in the sense that she'll enjoy continuous ownership over it. God is free to drive the Jews from the land just as he drove the Canaanites before them. 
But unlike the Canaanites, even without a land, Israel